we'll put it in the chat later. Uh, and Amy, uh, if you can at some point put the link to John's book in the chat, and I'm gonna put a link to this conversation where you can watch it again on YouTube and share it with friends if they couldn't make it. And I think I'll just give it another minute. And just a little bit of housekeeping before we begin, we're gonna talk for about a half hour and then we're gonna welcome questions. But at any point, if you wanna put questions in the Q and A um, or you can put it in the chat and Amy and I will keep an eye on that and um, bring that up at the end. And I think, I think I will begin. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Janet Forrest. I'm one of the adult program coordinators at the Nantucket Athenaeum, along with my colleague, Amy Janess. And tonight's speaker is John Vandemore, who wrote uh, Rig Justice. I'm going to do just a brief introduction. For 11 years, John ran the prestigious Stanford University Sailing Program, in which he coached Olympians and All-Americans. Early one morning, everything came crashing down when John opened the door to find FBI and IRS agents on his doorstep and learned that a recruiter named Rick Singer had used him as a stooge in a sophisticated scheme to play to the endless appetite for university fundraising and to wealthy parents looking for an edge for their college bound children. John was summarily fired and though he never received a dime, he was the first to be convicted in what became known as the Varsity Blues Scandal. John's memoir, Rig Justice, How the College Admission Scandal Ruined an Innocent Man's Life, is a riveting true story of how he was drawn unwittingly into a web of deceit and offers a damning portrait of modern college admissions and the way in which justice and fairness do not always intersect. Welcome, John. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> and I want you to start by just tell us a little bit about your sailing career and how you ended up at Stanford. Sure. I, uh, I started sailing on Cape Cod, grew up on Cape Cod, and started sailing through the sailing program at Hyannis Yacht Club, and really fell in love with the sport on the Cape, and went to be able to compete in sailing in high school, um, which I went to St. George's School in Newport, Rhode Island, and then on into college at, at Hobart College. I got a degree in uh, chemistry and geology and quickly threw all that away and started coaching sailing <laughs> um, and was started coaching youth sailing in Chicago and then eventually got into college sailing, was assistant coach at St. Mary's uh, College in Southern Maryland and then uh, became the assistant and then the head coach at the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis and then eventually made my way out to Stanford um, where mm -hmm. I spent 11 years. Yeah. And um so talk a little bit about, um, you woke up one morning, FBI and IRS is there. And I got the impression this was your first kind of foray into the legal system. And talk a little bit about what it was like navigating that for someone that just really had no experience with that. You know, I don't even know if I have a word for it. It was so overwhelming um, and not what I thought it was. Um, going into it. I think everybody has this conception of what our legal justice system is and how it works and sort of the structure is there that way, but it was very different um, from me. The, the experience was, was that you didn't know who to trust and you didn't know where to turn. Um, I was, when the FBI and IRS came to my door, I was really trusting in them to help me and explain to me what was going on. And that's certainly not what they were there for. Um, and that was certainly naivety in my side, but also, you know, a lack of knowing what was going on with the Justice Department in there. Yeah. Um, and as I was watching, and I also watched the Netflix documentary, um, Operation Varsity Blues, and your story stood out to me. And when you reached out about, you know, I saw you had this book, I was like, oh, I'm so much more so interested in hearing from him because there was a lot of Scheiderfreude about a lot of the people involved, like these coaches that took so much money and these parents who were just kind of despicable. And you were sort of lost in between. Like, I remember thinking, you know, why him? Why do you think it was so important for them to go after you when in so many cases, they'll just let things go. I mean, there's people that have done far worse things that have just been like 
sw- it's been swept under the carpet? And why do you think it was important for them to bring this out into the light and go after you? I think there was a few reasons for that. And, and obviously, I don't know if we'll ever know the true reasons, but so this is just completely my theory on it. But one is the environment at the time was, I guess you would categorize as anti Ivy League level school or anti high education. It was it was getting battered in the the media constantly, um, and I think that was a, a the environment that it was in. The other part of it is that I worked at a school as uh, Stanford, and Stanford was a big name, a big brand name, and certainly a a school that had really no tarnish at all on itself. Uh, and this would be a mark on Stanford. And I think that was certainly something that the prosecutors were very interested in pursuing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And you wrote in the book that it, it was, it, it was a messy situation. Like there were all kinds of people involved in different ways. And what they really wanted was to bring down a whole bunch of group, like a, you know, in order, I think it was the um, racketeering charge. You really need a group. And by having you there, it kind of made what should what they wanted to be black and white gray and a little messy. Yeah, that's right. My, my case was very different than the other coaches uh, that were charged in this because I didn't take the money. Um, I, I didn't gain financially from it. And um, from what I learned now about fraud, it is all about financial gain. Um, that's how the law is written. And since I had no financial gain, it was hard for them to, to prosecute me with everybody else. And so it made it a very interesting case. And it's certainly the reason why um, they wanted to have me do a plea deal uh, in the beginning and get me out of the case as fast as possible. Um, because they, I think they felt like it would hurt their case overall. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you did take a deal and um, you said that you made the best choice for your family. Like it would have been possible to go forward. Your it sounds like your lawyer always made sure it was your choice. You had always had the option, but over and over again, even when you questioned it, you said this is this is really the best choice for my family. And what's it like looking back? It's now I think two and a half years. What's it like looking back on that decision? And how do you feel about it? It's still just as scary. Um, but it's still the right decision. Uh, I was actually just talking with my lawyer um, a few days ago and he always checks in with me and says, so you still feel okay about this. You still feel we we did the right thing. And and when we lay it all out, there just really wasn't a path forward because of the way the case was presented as a racketeering charge for me to really defend myself. And because I would be so deluded in my defense because I was the least culpable um, in all of this. And so we would have all these other coaches and all these other schools with all their admissions processes were, which are going to be very different than Stanford's and different from each other. And for a jury to keep track of that and remember that I was different, especially when my lawyer wasn't going to be able to speak that much, it was going to be really tough. Um, Now that we saw, and certainly I think COVID had an impact on this, but we saw pretty much every coach plea out. Um, certainly that wasn't predictable in the beginning. Um, I think there's only two coaches or a coach and athletic director that's, um, still defending themselves. I believe they go on trial very soon. Um, so we didn't know that that was going to happen and the government wasn't really giving us much information of who or how many. Um, so we made, I believe the best decision we could with the information we had. Yeah, absolutely. And at the end of the documentary, they list, you know, these parents, served I think four months or six months like it was such a small and and so disproportionate because at the time your kids were you know one in three I think and you know when you think of like what it cost you emotionally and financially and all that and then you think like a lot of the people that got such a little punishment that have the resources and who knows if I don't know if they actually served the time um can you talk a little bit about that yeah certainly approaching it and making that decision to plea and still um, really have a a serious, I didn't end up going to jail, but still was a possibility. Mm -hmm. Um, Realizing that I could be away from my kids for a long period of time uh, was, was really petrifying. I mean, it was, it was debilitating even just thinking about it because each of these charges that they were going to bring against me um, 
could have a sentence of 20 years. Uh, would I, would they really do end up serving 20 years? No, you don't, but you don't really know how much of that will happen. I do think the parents had a lighter sentence in this, or most of the parents had a lighter sentence because of the way the government formed this case and because of the fraud. This is their biggest fear with me is that because it's hard to say that the school was defrauded of any money in most of the parents' cases. I know there's some exceptions, but in most of the parents' cases, because the school still got tuition. And to say that the school lost money in this, I'm not saying this is right or wrong. I'm saying this is how the law is written, is that you are defrauded. You're defrauding if you have a loss of money. And there really wasn't in the parents' case. And so we saw in my sentencing, uh, the prosecution really panicked um, and broke the plea deal with me so they could really fight for the parents' cases and change the plea deals and the information that they had signed with the other parents to, to defend this. And it's really all about the right sentencing guideline for it. Um, so it, it, it was very scary to think that I could be stuck uh, with that, with, with being away from my kids. There's another part of it as well that we were lucky enough to write out in the plea deal. And I think most people don't realize what happens is if you're found guilty or if you write a, you're in a plea deal and you don't write this section out, it can really cost you um, your financial life. All the money that was due or all the fines that were due, the defendants can push the money to each other in the racketeering case. And so if, you know, Felicity Huffman was found to owe a ten, you know, a $50,000 fine, she can come after me for some of that money um, to be able to pay that. And if there's 30, 40, 50 parents in that, that is, we're talking about some serious money that I've never seen in my life. Um, I was a sailing coach. And so that was another really scary part of, uh, of being part of this. Yeah. And talk, and I do want to move on to you know what's happening now but talk a little bit about you didn't serve jail time but there were severe consequences and just talk a little bit about what happened in that year after when you went back to your family and trying to get back on your feet yeah it was it was certainly severe consequences i mean uh, a ten thousand dollar fine which i had to pay um was uh had a big impact on our financial life um for sure the especially having to start again and move out of the housing that we're living in, um, finding um, daycare, finding um, health insurance and so on and putting that all together uh, was a real struggle in itself. The other penalties of being in house arrest for six months um, was, was real. I, I, I can't believe I have to say this, but my probation officer, um, when I was talking with him, he said, most people he talks to, they don't know whether the worst thing is to be in jail for six months or to be in house arrest for six months. And I thought that was so absurd that he would say that. I was, I was very thankful to be home. I got to see my kids at night and be in my bed, but it really is, is tough, um, especially with kids because I couldn't take them to school. I wasn't allowed to do that. I couldn't take them to the doctor. I couldn't take them to school or do anything. And so it really was a huge penalty on my poor wife. Um, that was working full time and supporting us at the same time. Uh, so it was, it was real uh, for that. There's another penalty that wasn't handed down to me, but was a big part of this case is the public humiliation and shaming um, was unreal. Uh, the, because I pled and happened to be, have the same judge as Rick Singer, I became kind of the face of this case uh, in the very early stages in the very first few days and the public shaming embarrassment to be on every newspaper and every news channel uh, to have my name and my face um, there because I was there in Boston in federal court. It was, it was brutal. Um, and it was, it was probably the hardest part. It was, it was a big toll to pay. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so different now. I just heard an interview with Anita Hill and what she went through in the nineties. I mean, there was no Facebook, there was no social media. It was much, you know, she received phone calls. She went through something unimaginably difficult, but you think of that now where there's the internet and everything can be shared so quickly. Yeah. 
yeah in memes which i never knew about before but the yeah. memes were were brutal and, and just really just really not nice yeah. <laughs> i don't know what to say but. yeah talk about some of the people that uh i guess how has that changed in the last year because you you know um, you have been featured in the documentary. You've been featured. You know, you have a book and being interviewed. Um, what impact do you think that has had on the public's perception of you? It has been, well, f- from my perspective, it's been a complete 180. Um, it is the the documentary. It really started with the Netflix documentary. And the day it came out for months and still to this day, I get thousands of messages of support on my social media platforms and uh, through email and so on. And it's, um, it's been incredible. And it's, it's stories that of people sharing their stories and their struggles and, you know, saying that they were able to connect with me through that um, meant a lot to me uh, and still does. And then being able to write the book, I think the biggest impact for me is a, one of the biggest reasons I want to write the book is for my friends and family and to have them reach back to me uh, friends that I grew up with on the Cape that I haven't seen for 30 years to have them come to a book signing or reach out to me through social media or something is um, it, it's just incredible um, to have that connection again, but to know that these people really know me and know who I am and they're happy to read the book to kind of solidify that in, in their minds. Yeah. And I enjoyed that piece of it because it's very much about the admission scandal and everything that happened to you, but there's a lot of just your history and how you grew up and your family. And um, I really enjoyed, like, I, I felt like I was like, Oh, I know John, (laughs) like I enjoyed reading. um, I enjoyed reading and getting to know you and your family and that piece of you. Um, And I, it's a nice uh, moment. I wish you luck with it, but it's a nice memento for you to have too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to talk, when you look back on this, where do you place, there's so many places to put accountability. Where do you think the accountability lies in all this? So, you know, I get asked this question a lot and (laughs) it's, it's tough because you can't put it on, you know, you would love to put it on one one person or one entity or one system or anything else. and, And it's not, that way. I always start with what are the responsibilities and stuff that I should need to put on myself because I can control myself. And I certainly take a lot of responsibility in this and that my first, my first belief or my first job as a coach was to always protect my student athletes. Um, you know, I always called it do no harm. And I certainly had no intention to, to do in this or to do any harm to them, but in the end, they became real collateral damage. Um, the, how the other students were treating them on the Stanford campus after this broke was horrible. Um, and they went through a lot. They were questioned a lot, even in job interviews, which just was seemed incredible. Um, and that was really, really hurtful to me. And I still think about that a lot to this day. Um, is that that impact for them? My responsibility, certainly, too, and and writing this book was a big part of that. I think in this book, I, I put out a lot of my vulnerabilities, um, not just with this case, but me as a person, as a coach, as a dad, uh, as a husband. Uh, I put that out there a lot, and I think it rings true to a lot of people because I do let myself be really vulnerable in that way, and really take responsibility. I know through the title and descriptions, it seems like that I'm just blaming it all on Stanford and blaming it all on Rick Singer and so on. And trust me, they deserve their share of blame, but I think I need to start with myself. Um, And this book is a lot of admitting that to myself and and where I could have found my way. Can I point to specific parts of it? And that's what everybody wants to know. Oh, what was the red flag? What was that specific point? And for me, I learned a lot through this case of context. Now it's so easy to see it, right? And everybody can see it. Oh, why didn't you know this and this conversation and there? And I even say that to myself, mainly in the shower or in my car. Um, But it's hard to see that and put yourself back into that environment and that situation. And I did so, so painfully in this book, but that's the hard part of say, could I really have known that? Should I have really known that? How could I have known that? Um, That's really tough. Where the system 
in terms of other responsibilities should be is, and I, it, it's tough to put blame onto it because you don't have, I don't have an answer to it, but fundraising becomes such a huge part of universities these days. Mm -hmm. And it's certainly linked to admissions. Um, you know, even though all schools say that they don't, it certainly is linked to admissions. Uh, and, you know, you know, there's some debate whether that's wrong or not. Um, I'm not here to debate that. I, I think that it's it's something that has to be thought about and has to be talked about. Um, but but it is real, especially when you look at the U.S. News and World Report. The U.S. News and World Report has been the bible for college rankings for a long time, and the people have kind of reverse formulated their their formula has seen that. Um, financial rankings and fundraising is a big part of their ranking. Um, so Stanford battles Harvard and Princeton and Yale every year for the top spot and fundraising leads the charge in that. That's something that they all can change. And so that's something that has a big impact. The, the sports world, when you look at that, we're a non-revenue sport mm -hmm. and we have to fundraise a fair amount of money to be able to function and, and move. Should it be a coach's role to fundraise? I would argue now, no, I never wanted to. That was never why I thought I was hired anywhere to, to fundraise. Um, there should be a department and there is departments that do that. And the coaches should be there to brag about their sailors and brag about their student athletes and what they've accomplished on the water and in the classroom. And that's their role. Um, but it shouldn't be to fundraise money. So I think the easiest thing is that should be separated out at every university, not just at Stanford or Georgetown or Yale, or wherever this was hit onto. It should be at every university that the coaches should be separated from that. Yeah, and I thought of that too, even outside the college world. I mean, Nantucket and the Cape to a certain extent is a world of nonprofits. We're all about nonprofits. We have a million nonprofits. And I recently read the, the book about the Sacklers, the Empire of Pain, and how, you know, so many nonprofits and museums and cultural uh, institutions were trying to walk back and they realized they had all this dirty money and they didn't know what to do with it. And, um, and I thought of that, you know, as I was reading the book is the colleges just need the money. They just want to take the money and then we'll ask questions later. And uh, there's always something attached to $500,000, $10 million, all these big chunks of money. There's going to be expectations, I think. Absolutely. And you could see that on the names of all the buildings when you walk on campus. There are, there are expectations. And, you know, certainly the donor that's going to put $10 million wants to know what they're going to get for that $10 million. Um, mm -hmm. It's not just because they're incredible people. Um, it's just how do we how do we separate that out of college admissions? Um, and does that really need to have a role in college admissions? Yeah. When you, you there's still a ways away, but like when you think of your kids applying for college, what new perspective do you have for them venturing into that? You know, growing up in the Cape in New England, which is the heart of, I think it's such an incredible educational heart, right? It's, it is the center of, it certainly was the center of my sport in college sailing, but it's certainly the center of incredible education. And my parents um, were both educators and certainly really valued those universities. But what I learned a lot from the Netflix documentary really of hearing the experts that they had and speaking is to open kids eyes to all the schools that are out there. Um, and it was certainly my experience too, that there's a lot of incredible universities out there that don't have the biggest names, but have a lot of great things to share. And working as an engineer now, I go through resumes to hire interns and to hire people uh, for our firm. It's not necessarily the, the big universities that make the best people um, mm -hmm. to work for your university or to work for your company. And so I think having that open eyes, there's so many people that want to go to the same 20 schools um, and they're really locked into that and they take a lot of pride in it, which there's some, there's certainly some good to that. But I think for my kids, I would like them to look in a broader perspe perspective and find a school that really fits them, not the name that they think fits them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like you look at what kids go through now um, because it used to be, well, the really smart kids will go to college, but it's like, oh, and you also have to be socialized and you have to play sports and you have to be an artist and, and you just need to be everything and you can't be everything at 17 and do it well and then also function as a human and it's just we put so much pressure on our kids 
We do. We do. And as a youth coach, and I'm still coaching um, on the weekends kind of part time, and I love it. I'm coaching 10 to 13 year olds. And even there, they're already thinking about college. Mm-hmm. And which is good that they're thinking about their educational future, but at the same time, they're missing out on a lot of other things in life. <laughs> and mm-hmm. I want them to push themselves academically. I think that's amazing, but they need to push themselves socially, emotionally as well. They need to push themselves, um, you know, out of their comfort zone. And they're less willing to fail and less willing to be vulnerable if they're worried about what university they're going to get into um, and what university is going to think about a decision or a class that they chose in ninth grade or eighth grade. Um, and I think that's, that's too bad. Yeah. What, um, tell me some of the good that has come out of this, either for you or even for universities or colleges or people in general. I think the, the good for, for me, um, has been really being able to look at myself, um, and really evaluate myself. And I, I like to think that I didn't need this large, massive, tragic event to be able to do that, but maybe I did. And to really try to make myself better um, as, as a person, as a husband, um, a, as a colleague, it, it really made me focus on what was really important to me, um, certainly my kids and my wife. And being able to be part of a small engineering firm was a huge plus for me. I originally started applying to large corporations, the tech industry, everything else, living out in the San Francisco Bay Area. And I went through a few of these interviews and I just couldn't do it. It just was, it was getting into a corporate grind that was just not, I felt myself getting stuck in the same things that I did at Stanford. And that's not necessarily a knock on those companies, but it's really not where I belong. And finding a small group, there's six of us that work in this engineering firm, and we're going to look each other in the eye and have tough conversations, um, which I feel like is so important for us. And we're going to be able to find things and support things with each other. And that's really what I wanted. So that was a big silver lining for us. And and certainly moving out here to Half Moon Bay um, has been amazing, too, to be by the ocean again. Um having grown up on the Cape and being by the ocean every day of my life, it's, it's fantastic to be back. And it's certainly been been better for the soul in terms of um, my colleagues, um, especially my sailing coaching colleagues um, from around the country. I feel like the good is that they're having these conversations that we're having tonight and they're having it with me and um, with each other and making sure that they're protected and they're, they're staying true to who they are and they're not getting stuck in kind of the, the university grind. Um, and I think that's a positive thing. And I hope they really are able to look at my story and my mistakes and grow from them. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm gonna, we're about half hour. If anyone has any questions that they'd like to put in the chat um, or the Q and A, go ahead and do that now. Um, but I will continue on asking um, questions. I had one more and then it just like slipped right out of my head. Um, That's so interesting that, uh, was it hard to go back to a different career after spending, I mean, you kind of fell into sailing opportunities kind of kept opening up and then all of a sudden, you know, you needed a a job and it was like, poof, I have this little degree. (laughs) So what was that like to go back to that? It, you know, it certainly started like that. Uh, I was at an Easter dinner when we first moved to the coast and my now boss uh, was like, oh, you need a job. What, what, is, what is your degree? I'm like, oh, chemistry and geology. I was like, great. Do you want a job? <laughs> you know? I was like, uh, sure. Um, it was like that. It, it, it was instant. Um, and I was lucky in that way and had incredible people around me supporting me. But it's it's been incredibly hard. I mean, yes, I have some educational background, but really I have to learn on my feet every day and I have to fail every day and figure it out and put it back together again. Um, and that part I really love because it was a lot like I did with coaching. Um, I had success and I failed and I put it back together again and I got success again. And, and I think that's, that's what I love about it. And the people that I work for are willing to have me fail and, you know, help me guide me through the the right answers. And so finding myself in that kind of new career and using those kind of new, those concepts um, really helped me 
um, to, to move forward and do something different, mm -hmm. but it's not uh, easy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so everyone kind of went through the surreal experience of the pandemic, but then you were going through it in a very, with compounded by these other circumstances. And I don't know, do you think the pandemic made it so much worse or so much better or what impact did it have on what you were going through already? Yeah. Um, the unfortunate part for me is that I finished house arrest and then we jumped right into a pandemic. Um, and that was, that was hard, uh, to, to be stuck with that. Um, I don't know if the pandemic made it worse or not. I, I work in an industry that we were, um, you know, I work in potable water and drinking water. And so we were a necessity. And so we got to work full time. So I was lucky that I could go to work and, you know, have purpose every day um, in doing that and, and leave the house to, to work there. And so I, I consider myself lucky in that way. Um, and that I felt like I was contributing every day to the community around me. Um, but the, the hardest part with, with COVID was certainly going through this process of writing the book and going through the story and thinking about how I'm going to continually discuss this with my kids mm -hmm. and being stuck in the same house and being stuck in the same space with them all the time um, was fantastic, but terrible at times too. And uh, it was, it was hard to think about how I was going to have that discussion. And I still have to, my son is five now and I've had discussions and, and they're highlighted in the book. Uh, I think if I talk about them, I'll start crying. Um, but I have to have more discussions. My daughter is three and we really haven't started having discussions yet about this and how it impacts me, but really all too soon, they'll probably have phones and they'll certainly, they already know what Google is and YouTube and everything else. And they're going to start searching these things and searching for me. And we'll have to have some real conversations, um, especially when their, their friends do that and find more about me. Um, it, it's going to be, it's going to be incredibly hard, um, to talk about that, I think, yeah. but to be vulnerable and be able to talk to them is going to be huge. Yeah. And, um, this is kind of a technical question. I know you have a brilliant lawyer it, and there's no way to make the felon charge go away. That's just there and it's going to be with you. And so what, on a day-to-day -day basis, what are things that like the average person wouldn't think of that apply to you now? Yeah. Um, so being a felon for the rest of my life, I will, um, I, I'm not allowed to serve on boards uh, and most boards. Um, it's not a huge deal for me, but I'm not allowed to own a gun. Mm -hmm. um, I, most states I'm not allowed to vote. Uh, and certainly through COVID and through these last few elections that has you know, that's been really sad for me not to be able to vote, not to be voiced. Um, I don't feel like as a citizen that way. Um, and, you know, for me, the biggest impact is we, we can't afford to buy a house. And so we have to rent. And on every rental application, I have to check the box that I'm a felon. Mm -hmm. And the, the way we got the house that I'm in now, um, and was able to rent here is that I check the box and then I, uh, stapled a couple articles about me um, to the application. Uh, some interviews that I did on June 12th, 2019. And just said, hey, this is who I am. If you have any questions, let me know. And uh, the renters really appreciated my openness by that because it's a box that you check. You don't get to describe who you are or what felony it was or anything else. It's just there. Right. There's no distinction on that box, like in that box between you and someone who's convicted of a violent crime or Right. Yeah. Um, the other thing is something we've been thinking about in our community, and I imagine a lot of communities is mental health. Mm -hmm. And I know that's, I mean, I can only imagine the impact this has had on your mental health and the mental health of your family. And I'm just wondering how, how you took care of yourself and what you've learned and how you continue to take care of yourself. Yeah, I, um, my wife was incredible and really supported me and encouraged me to get therapy right away. Um, I did and was with a therapist that was really helpful. Uh, helpful for me first, the first hurdle was to get through June 12th, my sentencing, 
and whatever repercussions that were going to come from that sentencing. And then it kind of switched to developing, you know, me and my mental health going forward and finding some skills to help me with that. I was then diagnosed with PTSD, um, which I, I didn't really understand at the time because I thought that could only happen to you know, people in the military or first responders and so on. And I, I learned a lot about it, did a lot of research on it. Um, I still need more therapy. I'm not with that therapist anymore for you know other reasons, but um, the pandemic kind of postponed that. I started trying to do it a little bit online and just was really uncomfortable. Um, it just didn't feel right and I didn't feel helpful. So I needed to do more uh, and I still need to do more um, work with that. The book was really cathartic for me. Um, it was... I mean, it was crazy. I would walk down the beach and talk on the phone at five in the morning um, with headphones on. And I think people that passed me on the beach thought I was just insane because um, I'm crying and laughing and, you know, devastated and um, somber and I just all the gamut of emotions. But going through that, I think is really helpful. And I still do that now to this day that when I have tough days and on those tough days, I take long walks and I talk out loud <laughs> um, and I own it <laughs> and it's just the way it is. Um, and it's also allowed a lot for my wife who also went to therapy for a while um, and is looking to continue as well through this, that we had a more open conversations with each other. And even though we're not therapists and we've not trained to help each other, I think we helped each other because we're partners in this. And that was really helpful and, and a big step for both of our mental healths. Yeah. Yeah. And it's only, I mean, it's been such a blur for so many people this last year and a half, but all of this is only, you know, it started two and a half years away. So there, it's not very far in the rearview mirror for you. And I'm just wondering, even with a little bit of hindsight now, I don't know, how has your perspective changed? How do you look back on things a little differently than when you were kind of in the thick of it? I like to think it's changed considerably. Um, it's one of the things I like to point to a lot is my perspective was so narrow. So I had such a tunnel perspective, such a tunnel view on, on all of this. And if I had only stepped back and thought more about what I was being asked of and what, who I am in comparison to what I was involved with, um, that I think would have changed a lot of things. Um, the simple thing of, you know, being on the phone with Rick Singer and the FBI, if I had just listened to what he was saying to me instead of just yan him to death, um, that would have changed my life right there. Um, but I didn't. And those are things that I've learned now to have much greater perspective and really understand who I am and how when things kind of enter my sphere, how it really impacts me and my family and making sure that I have the right perspective through all of it. We have a couple of questions in the chat uh, or in the Q and A. Let's see. Amy asks, "What advice would you give to high school a high school sailor who's beginning to look at colleges with the hopes of competing at the college, collegiate level?" So it's the same advice I was I would give when I first started coaching: is um, go and visit the schools. You've got to go and visit. You've got to get a good feel of all the people because the university, even though they build these incredible buildings and fundraise for all these incredible buildings, it's about people. And you have to envision yourself at that university and really feel that you can fit in with that group of people and realize that whether, you know, for some reason you broke your leg and you can't sail, will you still be really happy at that school? I think so many people that I've recruited and I worked with were so interested because they wanted to go to the Stanford name or, or to the Naval Academy. And they didn't think about, do they really want to go to those schools or they just want it for the sailing aspect of it and choose the school for the school first. And it's, it seems very simple to say, but sometimes it's really hard to execute um, and, and really believe in that. So, so do that for sure. In terms of the sailing, my biggest suggestion is everybody thinks that you have to you know, be in certain classes of boats and be able to sail in a very narrow path. I think the, the sailors that I've seen really succeed in college sailing are the ones that have a broad perspective and are sailing in multiple classes or sailing with adults, sailing with in youth classes and finding success there, but really opening up their horizons and really 
fully immersing themselves in the sport itself, not just on what could be successful or not to get you into college. Uh, I have a follow-up. This might be a little bit of a tangent, but I was thinking a lot about the, um, it came out a couple months ago, they were going to start compensating basketball players, like mm-hmm. college basketball. How, how do you think about that? Like, you know, I don't know. What are your thoughts on, on that? Yeah, it's, it's showing a big division in collegiate sports, right? Where football and basketball are now going to be compensated for their likeness. Um, We're seeing football players that haven't even before they even took a snap are making hundreds of thousands of dollars um, in their likeness. And they're choosing schools that are going to give them that opportunity. You would never think that for a field hockey player um, or a soccer player, even, or certainly not for a sailor or a tennis player, you know, that's probably not going to go into play. And it's, it's really further separating football and basketball from collegiate athletics really um and i think there's going to be a head that's there's going to be a crossroads coming up soon that is football and men's basketball in particular are they healthy for colleges are they healthy for the collegiate sports Because collegiate sports are amazing tools and they help people grow considerably and we don't need to invest billions of dollars to make it successful we need the college experience and the collegiate experience and are they getting that um, when they have personal masseuses and barbershops in, you know, football offices? I, I just don't, you know, I, I don't think so. Yeah. Talk more about that. Like someone who goes into sailing other than just doing their classwork, they take on a, a sport. Mm-hmm. What are those tools? What, what do you, what's the value added for kids that do that in college? Well, there's now there's, I think even more so when I was in college, I guess everybody would say that, right? But um, (laughs) there's a ton of value added. The the resources are incredible. The the collegiate sports that are really focusing on mental health, um, like we talked about before, the mental health resources are so helpful for all these um, students that are coming into college and have this incredible experience, but it's a really you know, you're changing and you're developing a lot as a human during that time. Being part of a sport is really helping you be part of a team and showing empathy and being able to deal with conflict. Um, I think sport thrusts conflict upon um, collegiate uh, students like nothing else. And I think that's really important. How are they going to deal with conflict on their team or they disagree with their coach or their team captain? Um, And how are they going to deal with that in a real world situation? I think that helps them for everything after, you know, college and collegiate sports, I think is a big, um, big help for that. The time management. Um, I think that's one thing that you could always point to is time management is, is huge. Whenever I was in school, I, whenever I was playing a sport, I was so much better at time management than when I wasn't um, in the off season. Uh, I really struggled in the off season to stay focused. Um, but in season, it was really easy to do that. Okay. Uh, all right, we have more questions. Um, Amy asks, what prompted you to write the book? So I, I got some advice early on. Um, I was very dismayed um, and really struggled with the media coverage, you know, if I have media coverage at all, because uh, I'd never had any media coverage in my life. And this was it. And it was just not right. You know, it was like they didn't read the case or they didn't really care about it. And I I really struggled with that. And I got some really helpful advice that said, look, you have two ways to tell your story. You could either write a book or take an op-ed in the New York Times. Everything else is going to be filtered. Um, And they were completely right. Um, Everything else is really filtered. And so writing a book, my first purpose was that, okay, I want to write my story for my kids. Um, And so someday that they'll be able to read it from my own words Um, what I went through and what they went through, even though they hopefully don't remember. Um, And then I really wanted to write it for my friends and family. I had friends that said, look, we need to hear your story. Why aren't you talking? Um, Why aren't you telling anybody anything? Because we, we know you and this isn't you, you need to tell us your story. And, and I really took that to heart and and realized that that was really important. The third thing was for my um, fellow coaches and for really anybody that's part of a large corporation that I think is amazing to be part of. And it's amazing to be loyal and 
you know, trusting in your leaders and your bosses and so on. But at the same time, you have to make sure that you are you and that you have a healthy perspective of what you're being asked of and what's being asked of you. And I think that's, um, that's really important. And I want people to learn from my mistakes. I don't want them to fall into the same, the same traps and the same minefield that I did and find themselves to have no way out. Um, as an addition to that, I really wanted people to know what the justice system um, was like for me and how I really had no way to defend myself, even though I had that right. Um, I really, there wasn't an opportunity there. And I think that needs to be talked about more and more. Uh, let's see, Judith asks, did you go to St. George's to sail? Uh, well, for two reasons. Um, sailing might've been number one. Um, I, Newport, Rhode Island is the, the heart of sailing for sure. Um, I lived in Annapolis as well, and I, I feel Annapolis is um, pulled for that too, but Newport was very special for me. Um, but I grew up on Cape Cod and went to a local private school because so my mom was a teacher there. Um, and my graduating class was going to be eight kids. And I was getting high honors and doing really well. And I wasn't being as challenged as my parents felt like I should be. And so they really suggested and encouraged me to go off Cape and, and go to boarding school. And, and that really had a big impact. And it was great. I got my butt kicked um, my first year. Uh, I thought I was at a good level and I was not. Um, and it was very eye-opening for me. So it was a very, I actually enjoyed my boarding school experience more so than my college experience. Uh, let's see. Ken asks, after all this, what do you think of the uh, indifferent professionalism of the FBI and law enforcement? Were you exposed to an endemic approach slash behavior of our national police or were their motives virtuous and you got swept up? Oh, that it's a tough thing to come to. Um, I, I have lots of friends in law enforcement and one particular friend that I write about in this book that was giving me advice. And we had a chance to have dinner together this summer. Um, and we went through this experience and he was just so infuriated at how I was treated by the FBI and the federal prosecutor and IRS and this, um, and kind of pointed to be say, this is what's wrong. And this is why law enforcement is getting a bad rap when there's so many good people in law enforcement as well. Um, I really came away with, and obviously I'm extremely biased, um, but I came away with a federal prosecutor's office that was looking for a way for what's next and are looking for a case and the way they presented the case to be promoted either in private practice or to get to DC. And uh, Boston became, especially under the Trump administration, a stepping stone for DC into the bigger office and people were really working their way up in there. Um, now that's a very blanket and very general and probably not fair to um, some good people there that are working, but unfortunately that was my experience. Um, let's see, this person wants to know, how is your relationship with student sailors that you coached when all this happened? Uh, and then as a sidebar, was Roy your coach at St. George's? <laughs> Yes, Roy was my coach at St. George's. I think he's been there forever. Um, yes, yeah, Roy Williams. Um, my relationship now has been really mixed. Um, there are some that have been incredible. Uh, the day that this happened on March 12th, there was probably about half the team that went to my house on campus and gave my wife flowers and sat with her and, and really helped her. And that was incredibly touching. Um, and they still are very, um, very communicative to me to this day. There's another half that will probably never speak to me again. Um, and that really, you know, there's a lot of emotion involved in this. And I think we saw this with, with lots of students all through the country, maybe through the world with this case in general, there's a lot of emotions that tied to this. And it certainly impacted the students that I had coached at Stanford and they're, they're devastated and they're hurt. And I don't blame them one bit for being devastated and hurt and how they were treated was horrible. Um, and I hope someday I'll be able to stand there and they could yell at me all they want um, and hopefully it makes them feel better. Um, but I think there's a real mixed, mixed emotion right now. Um, 
Greg wants to know, have you communicated with other college coaches who are caught up in the scandal? So I didn't know any of them going into the case. I never even heard any of their names before. Um, but since this, actually recently when my book came out, there was one coach that did that got caught up in this and um, went to prison um, for six months, I believe, um, for a long time. And uh, he's reached out to me and we've talked a few times um, really for me just to listen. He's in a, a really dark place. Uh, he's really struggling. And I think he's a, a good person. I, you know, he, he did take personal money and he um, is really devastated by that. Um, but I'm just there to listen to him right now. Um, let's see. People have a lot of questions about your <laughs> past coaches. And was Scott your coach at Hobart? <laughs> yes. Scotty Clay <laughs> was my coach at Hobart. Yep. Since people are asking, talk a little bit about your experience, like, you know, from high school, you kind of brushed over at the beginning, but mm -hmm. talk a little bit about what it was like starting out. And I don't know, people, people want to know. <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, it, you know, now looking back at it, I was, I was certainly very lucky in how it all planned out, but I you know, grew up in a high yacht club and was, and people might know this name as well, but uh, was able to be mentored by a guy named Tyler Moore, um, who was an incredible and one of the better sailors um, in New England and turned out to be in the country, um, did an Olympic campaign and stuff as well, and was really pushed forward um, with him. And then I got a chance to go to St. George's and do high school sailing there. I didn't do any high school sailing on the Cape. Um, it wasn't until I went to St. George's that I did it there and really fell in love with that type of the sport. Um, sailing is very different in terms of what kids do in the summer and the high school style and collegiate style sailing is very different. Um, so I really fell in love with the kind of collegiate high school style. And I had Roy Williams as my coach there um, as well as a few others. And then I got to go to Hobart and was recruited to go to Hobart. Uh, I was before cell phones. So I got, we had a rotary phone in the dorm and I got a call one day from Scotty Clay. And that was, that was really cool. I felt very, very good about myself when, you know, somebody's yelling down the hall that there's a coach on the phone for me. Um, and I felt very special. It was, it was a great experience. I learned a lot at Hobart uh, as well. It really Certainly learned a fair amount about sailing, but I learned more about life uh, in college and went through the normal college struggles that I think everybody does and grew from that, I hope. Um, but it was, it was really good. And watching the coaches that I had uh, with Scotty Clay and with Roy Williams and Tyler Moore and others, um, I really encouraged me to, to start coaching as a job. And so I started first at Merck Pharmaceuticals and that didn't work out very well. And it wasn't for me. I didn't want to be in a lab and then got a job coaching and really fell in love with it and really drew from my experiences from the other coaches to make who I was as a coach. Um, we talked a lot about the lessons and what you've gotten out of everything you went through. Um, I think there are people that are resilient and there's people that, you know, could be in your situation would have spiraled completely out of control and who knows what would have become of them. What prepared you, what skills, what qualities, what preparation do you think allowed you to move through this with what seems like an admirable amount of grace? Um, well, I appreciate that. I, for me as a coach, I was always into the process. Um, it was very easy as a coach to be obsessed with the result, but it was really about the process. And so I had my dark days um, when I got back to uh, Stanford because I lived for, they couldn't kick me out for a month. So I lived for a month on campus. And so I was living on the campus of my victim. Um, and I, the first two or three days, I didn't leave the house. I was scared. Um, I heard helicopters over the head and I thought that they were there to video me. Um, I'd never had the experience of having a video, you know, TV cameras shoved in your face and it's not fun. Um, and it was one day my wife was like, well, let's start by go to the grocery store, you know, and do that. And, and she was really the one that helped me get back on the path of, you know, a process of, okay, I've got to do this today. And, 
then I've started picking up jobs. Okay, I've got to find health insurance. I've got to find a place to live. I've got to, you know, find a job or figure out what I can do until my sentencing and, and work myself through that. And I gave myself reasons to get out of bed in the morning and, um, and do that. And then that kind of grew into me um, getting outdoors and go hiking and get more physical and it kind of hurt my body a little bit, you know, go climb up a mountain and huff and puff and drag yourself down a little bit and, and go out there and scream and yell at yourself and have people look at you and, and do all these things. And it was really, really helped me go through it. Um, and I just thought as a process that there's going to be an end goal. And I, I couldn't really see the goal at the end yet or what that was going to look like. But I knew if I just stuck to the process of just trying to be my best self every day, um, that that was the only thing I could do because I didn't want to be a felon for the rest of my life. And that's who I was. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be me, John Vandemore for the rest of my life. Um, cause that's who I've always been. And I don't think being a felon changed that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's, so you have the book out. What's next for you? What, what do you see yourself doing in the next year, next five years? <laughs> What's next? <laughs> Um, spending a lot of time with my kids. Um, that's certainly my priority and learning as much as I can in my new career uh, and continuing to grow with that. I'm really looking forward now that, um, I don't know if we would say COVID's over, but now COVID's more open, um, that I can go and be part of my community. Um, that was a hard part of moving and then having COVID, being stuck at home, and then I don't even know my neighbors. Um, and so it's nice to, to be able to be part of the community and do that you know, the nice thing for me is in college sailing, I was gone every weekend, um, usually flying to the East Coast. So I was just commuting back and forth. I feel like I knew the people of the United Counter and SFO more than I knew my neighbors. Um, I think that's totally true. And now it's, I get to spend the weekends at home. Um, and I still get to coach a little bit and be on the water. And I'm going to take up fly fishing. And I want to do stuff like that. And that's going to be my, my future. Um, and I don't have a goal or a career goal or anything else. I'm just going to keep living every day right now. Well, thanks so much, John. Um, here's the book, everyone. Rig Justice. I really enjoyed it. We have it at the Athenaeum um, or Mitchell's and Bookworks should have it um, at the local bookstores here. So uh, thanks so much, John. It was really a pleasure getting to know you. And I wish you all the best luck with the book and life and your family and everything. Well, thank you. Thank you for talking with me and thank you for having me. It was great to be here. <laughs> Take it easy. Thanks. You too.